We welcome you all to the CMCL FRI Alumni Club Initiative, the webinar series to support teaching during COVID-19. And today in the second webinar, we are going to discuss on online postgraduate teaching in COVID APAC, the ways. So today's faculties, the lead faculty is Dr. Mohit Joshi. Dr. Mohit, can you wave? Hello, hi, good evening all. We have with the, us Dr. Geeta Negi, Dr. Padmini, Dr. Parag Chavra. Hi, hello, good evening all. So now I hand over to Dr. Mohit to start the webinar too. Hi, good evening all, and I welcome you to this second series of webinar. So this uh, COVID time has been little testing, but at the same time, it has been a learning experience. The time has been bad, but it has given us some lessons. During this time, we all have learned about various online platforms for e-learning, which we were not aware earlier of. We discussed and we shared about Zoom, the Google Classroom, the GoToWebinar, and some of the platforms which are you know, for particular issues like the several platform which we have in our AIMS as a learning management system. So during this online period, online teaching period, I could go into the depth of this platform and learn more about it. We have utilized it. We learned how to conduct classes on these platforms. We understood the technical nitty gritty of it. We devised some technique to take classes on it. In fact, we devised some indigenous ways which we learned during this time, like how to ensure participation of the, of, the, of the attendees and how to improve interactivity. So although the time has been bad, it has given us some lesson and this has been a good learning experience. Now how the online PG teaching is different from the undergraduate teaching? Yes, it is different. There are certain advantages. The, the biggest one is the number of students, they are limited. So it becomes easy to manage that small group. And because the group is small and we can have one-to-one -one interactions, so there is better interactivity. This comes with some challenges also. So one of the challenges, the patient care related teaching, which is like, which cannot be done without patients. The, ch the second challenge is about the clinical case presentation. There are others like skill teaching and assessment. And in the subsequent discussion, I'll just tell you that how we did to circumvent around these challenges, how we try to overcome them. For some we could, for some we are still struggling and I'll take you through this journey. What has been our endeavors during this time of COVID era, we continued with daily classes. It was from our institute, something called a SET facility. It stands for Skill E-Learning and Daily Medicine Facility, where we have dedicated studios or lines where we can uh, share the online teaching to the, to the whole uh, group. And for like uh, other postgraduates, we continue with Zoom platform because the number of students, they are limited. So we uh, use the free version of it. We ended up various teaching learning activities for this platform. We had various topic reviews that are kind of like uh, more general and at times COVID specific also. Now this becomes easy because most of the times these topic reviews, they're kind of a monologue where there is a main speaker who speaks and the other one can raise hands so they can, they can join in for question and answer at the end of the session. So this becomes a little more easy to discuss on online platforms. Even the general clear presentation which we continued is also not very difficult. The topic to discuss in these general clubs, it can be shared online, on email or WhatsApp a few days before the presentation. And then when everybody is prepared, we can discuss them uh, during our online general clear presentations. They don't pose much challenge and they can easily be continued. The problem comes with some clinical case presentations. So I'll take you that how we uh, try to overcome all these problems. These are snapshots of some of our chats where we took these classes. So the first one was a structure of a manuscript. So these kind of classes, they are easy to conduct because there is one teacher and the other people, they, they listen. So it becomes kind of a didactic lecture. Although there is some inbuilt interactivity, so we had question and answer sessions uh, during this, uh, these presentations. Case presentation become a little more difficult. And then the, the last one, we, which you can see on the right side, this was webcasted through the, the issue platform. 
let's come to the challenges and how we have overcome them. So uh, in clinical science, the biggest teaching it is on the bedside. So whenever we're taking grounds, the, the patient problems, they air up and how the resident goes about it and how he man plans the management becomes uh, a kind of teaching learning experience for them. But when there are no patients, then how we can overcome this. So what we did during this time, we gave them practical topics to discuss. So we gave them these kind of topics and they were uh, kind of mixed with the complexities. So some common things which are done on bedside and which like you know, first year resident should know, like perioperative fluid therapy, management of some of the common complications which we encounter in our ward patients. So they were given to the junior residents so that they can discuss and still we can have, we could have some taste of that bedside kind of teaching, bedside kind of clinical teaching during this era, even when the patients were not available. We made it a little more complex for the third year residents. So some more complex topics were given to them to discuss. And again, although this cannot replace the bedside teaching, but then it was very close to it. So all these topics, they were discussed in detail. And uh, not only we gave them the topic, we also suggested from where to read so that uh, we can generate some good discussion out of it. And what we have done is we have made some unit specific protocols based on these discussions. So uh, these bedside clinical topics, they were discussed also. And we took this also as an opportunity to develop some uh, specific uh, uh, guidelines for our particular unit. We had so many uh, faculty lectures also during this period. The second case was regarding the case presentations. And when we talk of clinical case presentation, the clinical study material is patient. So at the beginning of this pandemic, the patients, they were available. And you can see in this picture, like although the, some of the bits, they are weakened, but then the patients, they are available. And we could manage the case presentation by images or by videos. I'll show you some examples. Like uh, we took verbal consent from these patients and all measures were taken to protect the identity of the patient. So this is what we did. So last week we had a case presentation of breast carcinoma where a resident presented all the history, examination, investigation, the operative plan. So this image particularly shows the operative plan and all the markings they were done on the patient and we could discuss them because the patients, they were available. And if you can see that we have taken all measures not to expose the identity of the patient here. Now, somewhere in between, like after a month or so, only few patients were available. So the see in this picture, this is the true picture of our ward, that most of the beds, they are now vacant and we have only few patients. These patients, they were there in the ward because of some, some social reasons. They were from far flung areas. They couldn't be sent back because of the lockdown. And uh, also we continued operating some patients of malignancy. So still uh, we had some patient on which we could demonstrate some specific skills. Uh, like I'll just show you that one of uh, the videos which a resident made on examination of, of uh, axilla. So this is how it goes. A consent from the patient. So I obtained a verbal consent from the patient to examine the axilla. So we'll be examining the left axilla for predominantly five groups of lymph nodes. Firstly, I'll be examining the anterior or the pectoral group of lymph nodes. For that, first I'll ask the patient to slowly abduct the arm and then place the arm on my left arm. I'll be using my right hand to examine the uh, anterior group of lymph nodes. So the anterior group of lymph nodes must be palpated just behind. So this is how we continued, uh, so this is how we continued with the videos and still like the, the resident could demonstrate how to examine and then we could stop her in between to uh, tell her that whether it's the right way or not the right way of examining the patient. But then the situation has changed now. Now we have only emergency patients and they're too sick patients to be used as the patients for formal case presentations. So like you see the patient in this image, uh, one with the plaster cast with like, you know, uh, he's so critical that he cannot be utilized. He cannot be used for a formal case presentation. These are practical issues, ethical issues as well. So what we did was we didn't stop with the case presentation here. We continued with some hypothetical case scenarios. So a resident presents a case history, examination, a pertinent investigations, and he presents the case. Although this is limited by the demonstration of clinical signs on the patient, but yet it is very close to a bedside uh, clinical case presentation. We could see how he thinks of uh, 
uh, you know, the history and examination and how, how we can uh, come to a diagnosis and we could dwell into the depth of uh, his clinical sense. So uh, it was quite close to a bedside clinical case presentation still. The other challenge was about skill teaching. So uh, in surgical science, most of the skill teaching is by hand holding, by demonstration. So when there were no elective surgeries, all the surgeries, they were rescheduled. So the opportunities to impart this operative skills to the residents was also limited. Now we thought some way of coming from this out also. And what we did was we started sharing our videos on operative procedures. So we shared these kind of videos over time. On the left side, you can see a video demonstration of a hernia surgery procedure. On the right side, it's called a thoracic surgery. And still the faculty could go and tell the detail about the operative procedures and resident also could ask. And in fact, we have taken some kind of assessment also uh, during presentation of these videos for the residents. We could ask them what would be the next step. So we could stop the video in between and we could ask them what should have been the next step or we asked them to, uh, to identify the structures. So it was a, still a learning experience, exactly not immediate, uh, almost like an you know, an, an operation theater, but very close to it. We took this opportunity also to expose them to some of the applications which are available free online regarding some surgical procedures. So uh, now these uh, apps, they are available free of cost and uh, they give you some, some kind of sense so that one person can operate, although not exactly uh, like you know, live surgery, but still very close to it if, with regards to simulation. And interestingly, these, these apps, they are good because they teach also. So a procedure, it can be taught. And then simultaneously, when the, when the person, he does that kind of uh, virtual surgery on that uh, virtual platform, uh, there is one more app to uh, assess it also. Now we're not sailing alone. This was a recent paper and all of us, we are facing the same problems. So in this paper, you see here that they have written that during this kind of uh, period, education is best achieved virtually. And this is what we all are doing at present regarding the surgical education. They also say that it must continue. The surgical education must continue wherever possible. So we are also continuing with that with whatever we have and whatever way we can uh, divert it to our residents. Not only this, uh, this is uh, the guideline for competency-based postgraduate, postgraduate training uh, for, uh, from MCI. And although it is not related to this particular COVID epoch, uh, it says that the department should encourage e-learning activities. So probably I think that this is the right time. This is the opportunity. This is the reinforcement where we can go through this and we can encourage and continue with e-learning activities even after the COVID epoch is over. Now we have one more challenge into us regarding the assessment. Here I would like to have your poll. So oh, wow, wonderful, like you know, most of them, like majority of them, they say that the, as of now, the assessment, they are deferred and they're waiting for the adverse time to pass. Yes, uh, we are also doing the same thing and we hope that this time pass as early as possible so that we can go ahead with uh, with our summative assessment. But then we have some mixed responses also. And the one which is like most interesting is that still uh, some of the insurer department, they plan to conduct both theory and practical assessments online. I'll just discuss something with you regarding the clinical assessment part. And then probably Dr. Geeta will also discuss on this thing as to how we are planning. But as of now, all assessment we have kind of postponed and then we are waiting for this time to pass over so that we can uh, we can go with the, the summative assessment formally. Again, I'll say that we are not sailing alone in this boat. So uh, this is uh, uh, this, this is a snapshot from uh, the University of Toronto. And here, if you read this, they say that they have postponed all their certification examinations and they have cancelled all the electors for the time being. So we are not alone. Everyone is having experience in the same situation. But everything is not bad. Every black cloud has a silver lining. And this is what we are hoping during the current time also. So uh, this has given us the opportunity to have some research related activities. So we have asked our residents to present their interim results of their thesis work. We have taken so many of faculty lectures and then one thing leads to others. So if there is a discussion and some things they are not clear, that was taken as a question, was taken as an opportunity to discuss further on a subsequent class. So this journey has been fabulous. We have also taken this opportunity to expose them to certain topics which they don't 
tend to you know being kind of taught or exposed otherwise so we have discussed some topics like how to make effective powerpoint and how to have the tips and tricks of medical photography so although the time has been bad but then we are ripping out best out of it so that we can give something fruitful to our residents with this now i hand over uh, the microphone to dr geeta she is my colleague from uh, aims rishikesh and uh, she will take you through the further discussion uh, and as to what they are doing uh, regarding pg teaching in this covid era over to dr geeta okay so um, good evening everyone so in continuation to what dr mohit has uh, really elaborated very nicely for all of us uh, i would like to continue uh, some more experiences that we had in our institute so as i said uh, a lot of theory we have discussed and he told us the differences advantages and all so i thought i would go ahead with some examples okay so i think everybody will agree when i say that uh, in the beginning uh, probably around uh, beginning of march or mid march uh, teaching everywhere took a back seat especially for the post graduates with, with the covid uh, in the covid um, the uh, prevalence coming up and uh, the hospitals getting ready for the testing and for the treatment so teaching did take a back seat and for a while we forgot about our pg teachings and all but then uh, after some time we prepared ourselves for it and then we all thought that uh, let's use online resources it this it looks like online is the only best bet uh, keeping in mind the lockdown issues and the number of residents number of faculty available people being posted in various areas and uh, the why online resources people thought of consulting was main distance was a reason was social distancing so now we could not continue with having our seminars conventionally in the seminar room and the lockdown was there and another uh, another uh, very uh, important thing was we find that uh, the new generation learners these post graduates they are just very fast these students are very techno savvy all right so now what we thought we thought we would use various platforms so the most common one that we used was skype so as you can see uh, we had conducted various sessions various seminars uh, and where uh, most of our residents could join us uh, this uh, this method seemed suitable for the post graduates more than undergraduates because the number of post graduates is relatively small in every department so the activities that we thought uh, we will see how feasible it goes uh, were seminars journal clubs thesis presentations because we had our thesis uh, submission coming up so we thought we would ask the students to uh, put up whatever they have done because students had a lot of queries they wanted to ask us a lot of questions and we were not getting the chance to meet so we thought of going ahead with some thesis presentations and then there were some issues which were no normally not so relevant but in the covid era they were relevant so one example i have given so i will just briefly over the next slide discuss how we tackled this issue so for this uh, there was an issue of that the students uh, demanded a lot of masks because everybody was scared in the beginning not only the students the guards the lab technicians i work in the blood bank so uh, we thought we would use uh, skype some more online resources even social media to address this issue because everybody was scared only lectures were not going to do anything about it so what uh, we decided was as you can see in the lower right part of the screen uh, a screen uh, this document was circulated from the government so i uh, actually put this up on the whatsapp group of our uh, department and i asked them to go through this search for more literature and then get back to us and then we would have a discussion so the jrs were quick because they were uh, very tense about this they were very apprehensive they did look it up and they found fantastic references through their online uh, resources and followed by this Uh, we did a skype meeting so over skype i asked the chairs to bring up the relevant points which they have searched regarding reuse regarding uh, what are the areas that where it should be used 
I knew the answers, but I wanted them to read and then come to me with the evidence. And when the evidence was there, there was much more acceptability. And uh, the whole department, everybody concluded that uh, the PP, the personal protective equipment is in short supply. It should be used rationally. And it was a success for us. And since it was coming from the residents, there was a lot of acceptance. I did not have to go and tell them to uh, follow what I'm saying because they had only come up with those things. So I found it to be a good method. Now some uh, issues that, uh, some common issues that emerged in the beginning of when we started our online uh, teachings, uh, everybody was very confused which tool to use. People were not very conversant with the modern technology. More than the students, the teachers were kind of not very comfortable using Skype and things. And there were a lot of audio issues. Sometimes the video would not come because we were not regularly, very, very uh, less times we were using online teaching. But here we had to do it a lot. So in the beginning, there was huge issues. And, you know, somebody was audible, somebody was not audible. And then telling people to switch on their mics or off and all that was a huge crisis in the beginning. But presently, I would say it's just about... Uh, say one month or so and uh, we find that uh, including the teachers everybody is more comfortable the activities happen very fast as i'm saying prompt activities happen so i announce an activity and you know everybody is ready including the faculty all the residents in your residence and question answer sessions have also started happening now for example after the seminar I tell them, I give them a few questions and then I tell them that you have to uh, put up the answers on the social media group. So the SRs are made to keep track of attendance. And, you know, the, I tell the SRs to especially do it because attendance used to be an issue. Somebody would join, somebody would not join. So, and with the help of these question and answer sessions, now they have to listen to what was asked. And then I give them a time that you have to respond within the next five minutes or so. So quickly they will be typing their answers and things. So it... Uh, I mean, it's a kind of um, a method for uh, adding interactivity to my sessions. So these were some, uh, some uh, kind of evolution that happened. And hopefully by next month or by the coming months and years, we will evolve. And even in the post-COVID times, we might want to stay with the online sessions more than before. Now coming back to the next example that I wanted to discuss, the assessment part. So in my institute, the, uh, for everybody for that matter, MDMS exams were being scheduled. So the, in April, we were supposed to have our prelims and uh, in May, the finals for the MD of students of my institute. So after a lot of confusion and chaos, the management one day decided that uh, they were not ready to postpone. Some reasons were given to us because the residents have not gone home. The regular elective surgeries are not happening. Elective patients are not coming. They have time. So they asked the faculty to be proactive with the online resources and things and try to go for the prelim examination using online resources a lot, maintaining social distancing, of course. So the modus operandi, I would say, because we were very uh, confused in the beginning. So as you can see here in the beginning, all the HODs were addressed regularly by Skype, Zoom, by our director and our dean, deanery, the entire deanery of examination. So they would talk to us regularly. They would address all the, uh, you know, the methodology to be used. They would address our queries, confusions. All this was happening. By that time, we were comfortable with Skype and Zoom. So we were quite okay with it. And then the uh, actually doing the exam, because the staff of the exam department, there are a lot of forms to be filled, disclaimers, external, so many things. So all that we did online. So if online wasn't there, this would not have been possible. And uh, I can say proudly that we have finished our preliminary exams and they finished uh, only one day before. The preliminary exams are over. We've learned a lot of lessons and we feel more prepared for the finals. So as you can see, since we are talking about online activities today, so regular faculty Skype meetings are essential. Uh, nearly, nearly every day, all of us were meeting and talking about the various uh, methods, how to conduct this exam, finalizing the theory, blueprinting, all that which we normally do over a meeting in the department. But here Skype was as good as that. And uh, selecting relevant pictures. So the one issue came that when uh, the spotting part was happening in the practical exam, so uh, some pictures were uh, shown to them on the phone. It can be sent to them on WhatsApp. So these kind of things we, I mean, we just, uh, some things we did just first time. So let me now discuss some practical challenges and solutions later on what we faced in this exam. 
I belong to the transfusion medicine department. We are semi-clinical, but then there are departments like Dr. Mohit, uh, general surgery, medicine, psychiatry, friends. There were a lot of challenges. So uh, some of the challenges I have enumerated, for example, eliciting the clinical signs, getting patient history, examining, the examiner wants to see them examining the patient. Then also evaluation of the psychomotor skill. Uh, a very practical problem which my psychiatry colleague mentioned was that the Zoom or uh, Skype app, it shows only the face. Whereas the psychiatry people, they say, for that matter, any other department, Department, the rest of the body language is also important. And a major issue was that the patients were less. Very few patients, because uh, this, uh, we had our exam last week. So patients were less. Only the patients who were there in the emergency department, the cancer patients, uh, so those patients were there. So these were some issues which honestly did come up. So let me discuss some solutions which various departments advised me how they handled in their own departments. So uh, some possible suggested solutions, I would say, because some would work for some and uh, some would not work for some. So one option was to have a lot of standardized patients. So uh, in my institute, we have a lot of OSCE. It's a cult huge culture of OSCEs. So many of our technicians, staff, they are already prepared to act. We, uh, we have trained them a lot to act like standardized patients. And then we would train a few more people. Then video recordings could be used. Uh, some department said uh, there are some uh, patients of chronic diseases whom we know by face. Uh, they're like very comfortable with us. So we have talked to some of them that uh, we will ask you to discuss with our resident on phone and tell your history. So some patients did agree to that also, but we'll see how it uh, works out ultimately. But this was one of the solutions by one of the clinicians. Simulated patients, as I said. Use of skill lab became a very important uh, modality in these times. And a lot of uh, COVID related training is also happening in the skill labs, use of mannequins. And uh, even uh, keeping in mind social distancing, camera recordings of all the above solutions that I just proposed, they could be used. That is one of the solutions that I can propose. Uh, another thing which could be used is a moulage. So the moulages are like uh, in the skill lab, uh, we have people trained to create this kind of scenarios. So all this is done on the clerks over there and they use different kind of material to create a hematoma, an ulcer, a gangrene. And these are all normal people on whom these are done. And video recordings could be done and shown to the student. So you could use it in your own creative and innovative way. So this I would suggest and uh, even I plan to use some of them as a short case in my department. Then um, uh, finally, just I want to also touch partly on the affective domain. So uh, who would think of that we would use an online resource to boost the morale of our people who are really very scared in this time. So uh, something which we did in our department was we prepared a message for the parents of the residents who are stuck with us, could not go home. We asked them to communicate and the parents were, you know, very happy and like they didn't have feel so much tension and they communicated. I got a lot of, a lot of um, nearly all the faculty, all departments sent these messages over social media. Then we, I also asked all the residents to prepare a combined video, to prepare solo videos and then send to one person who combined all of them and we circulated to everybody and they all felt so good. And it really, uh, you know, resolved some of our tensions. It contributed to team dynamics hugely. And we all felt a better morale and a feeling of uh, feeling good. And then another online thing which helped us was that uh, through the online things only, I used to pay, post a lot of things on Facebook. So the International Society of Transfusion, it accepted, it uh, appreciated uh, some of the things that we were doing to ensure blood supply. So they featured us. So all these online methods, why I'm mentioning here is that they help us to even boost the morale of our students. So I really found the online systems very helpful to maintain my department in this time of COVID. So uh, the final exams are finally scheduled in May. Uh, for theory, the plan is to, uh, we have a uh, computer lab in our institute and the, presently the undergraduates, uh, it's a hundred uh, computer setup and uh, the students sit individually and for the postgraduates also it could be used. For the practicals, the plan is presently is that the externals have agreed to assess on Skype if needed, if the lockdown is not over by that time. And uh, we are thinking that we will send them some details previous, prior to the exam, uh, things like investigation, reports, CT, films, x-rays, and even uh, live videos when the exam is happening, uh, we can uh, telecast it to them directly. Uh, we will use a lot of OSCE 
for this. I have talked to a lot of clinical departments also. So the plan is to use OSCE a lot for this purpose. So that is how uh, we are thinking. And uh, that was all from my side. Many thanks. And it is over to um, Dr. Pad Padmini from my side. So I'm continuing with the presentation. So I'll be talking about e-portfolios with reflection, then introduction, and these portfolios are used for learning, formative assessment, and reflective practice. Some references, acknowledgments, and thanks. So e-portfolio is uh, one of my favorite platforms, both in the pre-COVID and the COVID era because it is loved by students and also it is convenient and cost effective. So what are portfolios? These are professional development portfolios is a collection of material compiled by a professional that records and reflects on key events and processes in the professional's career. E-portfolio is an electronic version. So for students, it's a collection of material that documents students' accomplishments, includes reflections on the learning processes and its outcomes. So the next few slides outline the introduction of e-portfolios for formative assessment of skills. So we had a faculty development workshop and some of our students were also included as speakers because they are very tech savvy so for the students we put all the information in our e-learning management systems which is based on Moodle and we also send some of the information through email so you can see that uh, we put it in Moodle along with the lecture outline and everything and when the student opens, then they see the files and they can download it and go through it. So even before the session started, they already went through the briefing and they submitted the e-portfolios to all the mentors. So this is the information given to the students in Moodle. So this is the material given to all the faculty after faculty development for assessing the e-portfolio. So when the e-portfolio is sent to each mentor, then they'll go through and then they'll fill up the form and either email to them or in the pre-COVID era, they'll, they may call them for a meeting and explain to them. And if there are any deficiencies, then the students resubmitted the e-portfolios. So currently, when the student come to the clinical year, then they are given a similar briefing. They are already well versed with e-portfolios. They have already done it in first year, actually during the first week of the after joining. So once they here, we ask them to do the clinical skills in the clinical skill lab, take videos by forming small groups, and then they post the videos in the e-portfolios, and then they send a message to the mentors through email so these are the videos posted along with other re relevant material and also the reflection about the how they prepared this portfolio and sent it to us so we have uh, in the logbook a small uh, table for assessment of these portfolios. And then the lecturer also gives the comments in the logbook. This is in the pre-COVID era. We also, even during that time, we used emails to give detailed feedback to the students in case they needed to resubmit. So after seeing the email feedback, the students resubmitted. So the e-portfolios were compiled in Google Sites, which is free. The clinical skills lab was used for the skill videos and students formed small groups of two or three and used their mobiles to record the skills. They sent their links to the mentors for feedback and resubmission as needed. 
and feedback was provided through email and sometimes face to face when before the covid era feedback was also taken from students and facilitators in google forms so some of the reflections by students so the students wrote these reflections with insight and some of the themes were how we can improve their skills and they have more confidence to practice in the ward it improved their teamwork and it was a fun way to learn and it also improved the time management skills because they had a lot of classes and in between they had to squeeze in the time to prepare these videos so what is the future so free platforms such as google sites may continue to be used for e portfolios with reflections for formative assessment especially in competency based health professions education it can be used routinely for pg training they can actually use the ward and whatever their skills they want to demonstrate even procedures they do can be recorded and there are very secure apps like mostra mostra which is being used even in banks and now they have uh, diversified into health professions education also so clinical assessment in e portfolios and there these can be also used for efficient patient care so this is the few of the slides for a few of the references and i would like to acknowledge all of them i'm just closing with a poem from a school written by a parent about the covid era so you can just go through it this was actually shared by one of the presenters in a ame webinar then i found it in the website so they mention even about teaching in the zoom and uh, thank you we thank you all the participants you can see lot of still are logged into there and uh, we also thank all the speakers with us today and uh, for uh, this online pg teaching which is a challenge but the, this no challenge which has been thrown to us also actually gives us a opportunity that we build some of these things after the covid the new normal make some of them the part of the curriculum and the, you might see and experience that some of them are really useful so thank you all thank you so much for being there thank you all the panelists have a good day stay safe thank you sir thank you thank you thank you